From the State Capitol, WFSU Public Media brings you Capitol Report. Blame and recrimination continue in the wake of the Democratic defeat in Florida. It's all a loud deflection and distraction from actually rolling up our sleeves and taking care of the issues that are most important to families. Also this week, everyone agrees Florida is now a red state, and one possible reason is that the Democratic Party has pretty much written the state off. The panhandle's been written off. Rural communities have been written off. We'll also hear about the dispute between the North Florida Law Agency and the state's child welfare organization when it comes to protecting troubled teenagers. I'm Tom Flanagan, online and on air. This is Capital Report and the end of week wrap up of top stories from Tallahassee. First off, hope you had a good Thanksgiving, and now that Black Friday is just about wrapped up, hope you didn't have too many struggles with the holiday shopping situation. And speaking of struggles, some Florida Democrats are looking for who to blame after they struggled during the 2024 elections. That continued a downward slide for the party in the state. We get more on that story from Tristan Wood. Vice President Kamala Harris only got 43% support in Florida. President Biden got almost 48% support in 2020. Democrats also only won six of Florida's counties this election cycle, when they won almost a dozen last cycle. Florida's Senate Democratic leader Jason Pizzo isn't shy about where he places the blame. In an interview with WFSU, Pizzo points his finger at what he calls far-left members of the Florida House that are very active on social media. He says those are Republicans' favorite Democrats because they have pushed for socially divisive issues like defunding the police, which allows Republicans to get a pass on how they are failing Floridians economically. I don't want, nor is it necessary, nor is it important, nor is it pressing to talk about transgender high school athletes, CRT, woke, AP African, all this book banning. It's all a loud deflection and distraction from actually rolling up our sleeves and taking care of the issues that are most important to families. Pizzo says when those members do talk economics, they do so in a way that is unnecessarily demonizing successful people. One issue he points to is rent control. Some of the Democrats in the House tried to fight a preemption in 2022 that keeps Florida cities from passing rent control ordinances. At the time, Pizzo called rent control socialism. Now he says some members of the left were trying to misrepresent who are actually landlords. Most of the landlords were not, you know, huge corporations. They may have been retired teachers or, or plumbers who had one or two apartments as an investment, as, as basically as their nest egg. And there was no cap. And this is what people fail to realize. But while we were all sympathetic to the, to the tenant, the landlord who owned that unit, you know, it's not a homesteaded unit, so there's no cap on their property tax increases. There's no cap on their insurance. They have debt service and mortgage payments that they're making on that unit. Although he didn't name her explicitly, one of the more progressive members of the Florida House, who is also active on social media and backed rent control, is Orlando Representative Anna Eskamani. She says it's Republicans, not Democrats, waging a culture war. It's not the left that's talking about those issues, it's the right. So, and I think that's a really important distinction here. Every issue he just named, it's not Democrats who are filing a bill, it's Republicans who are filing a bill to distract from real issues. Eskimani backed the Orange County Rent Control ballot initiative that the state legislation preempted. She says it would have exempted mom and pop landlords and allowed rent raises with property tax increases. She believes pushing for issues like rent control is part of the reason she has been successful. Ironically, the one that he's railing about rent control, the voters in Orange County voted for it, approved it. And that was that was, by the way, the same cycle where we had a penny sales tax on the ballot for transportation and voters rejected that. And there was millions of dollars spent in support of the penny sales tax referendum campaign-wise and millions of dollars spent against rent stabilization by the Florida realtors, and it still passed. So, I mean, it is an issue that voters really care about because they're feeling exploited by their corporate landlords. I mean, they pay high rents and don't get benefits from that. I'm a renter still. 
So I empathize with that too. Both politicians pointed to their electoral success this cycle as evidence that their vision for Florida Democrats is how to move the party forward. Pizza won his Broward seat by about 58%. Escamani also won her seat by 48%, though hers was more Democrat favored. Both had Republican challengers, but Pizzo's opponent, Imtiaz Mohammed, was a Democrat in 2020 and received little political contributions or support from the GOP. Greg Pohl, Eskimani's challenger, got 40000 in political donations, including over $23,000 directly from Florida GOP sources. It wasn't all losses for Democrats against Republicans this cycle. Democrat Leonard Spencer flipped Orange County's House District seat 45. Florida House Minority Leader Fentress Driscoll says they were able to win that seat by talking about kitchen table issues. If you look at the Florida House Democratic Caucus's platform over the past few legislative sessions, it actually includes no culture wars. What happens is the Republicans, the extremist Republicans, tend to bring these fights to our doorstep. And I think, you know, the opportunity for the Democratic Party now is to think through, okay, how do we protect groups who need protecting but also make sure that we're centering those, those kitchen table issues. She says her caucus in the House is united on core values, but members represent 35 different constituencies. I think that it's important to stay focused on the issues and not so much what divides us. I think it's really easy to try to, you know, Monday morning quarterback an election and pick apart all the things that went wrong. I'm really interested in figuring out how we move forward and how we uplift the stories of everyday Floridians who frankly are getting trampled by the Republicans in action on property insurance and housing affordability. That's our opportunity right now. One element to disagreements between Pizzo and Escamani is that both are on political watchers short list of potential contenders for the 2026 Democratic gubernatorial nomination. Certainly, what direction to take the struggling party would be one of the issues at center stage during that contest. I'm Tristan Wood. Karen Woodall, a legend in the Florida Capitol, has devoted more than 40 years advocating for people from marginalized communities. That includes immigrants, farm workers, children, and the poor. On the Deeper Dive with Derek Ham podcast from the News Service of Florida, Woodall shared insights about challenges facing Democrats and offered this advice, don't write off rural Florida. Here's an excerpt. Let's talk a little bit about where we're at with the election. You're doing advocacy. You're doing training for community organizing and other kinds of activism. What advice would you give the Democrats right now? What do you think they got right and what do you think they got wrong? I think one of the challenges that Democrats have faced for a while is that we tend to leave people out. We ignore areas or funders who fund organizations who are going to do voter registration and voter turnout. They're going for the the big bang for their buck. So they want to go to urban areas that are concentrated and you can get to more people. And essentially forever, the panhandle has been written off. Rural communities have been written off. And people in those communities actually should have a greater affinity towards democratic principles and policies. A lot of them are poor, they're low income, but they don't identify because they're ignored and they're left out. Is that why or is it because they don't identify with some of the other, I'm using air quotes, culture? Culture? Yeah. I think it's probably a mixture of both. Okay. But in my experience, you can help people view these so-called culture wars differently if you have a relationship with them and they trust right. you on other issues that you're working with them on. And when I talk about organizing in rural communities and left out communities, I mean with trusted messengers that they know. You don't drop people in there four months, Three months before, before the election. The election. And, I and you know. really don't do that anywhere. Right. With somebody from another state. state. Yeah. Right. That has yeah. no clue. And that's that's true with any organizing around electoral politics. 
that should be done year round. And it should be done in the context of working with people in the communities and listening to them. And I know this has been being talked about, but it's, it's very true. Listen to people, help them with things they need help with leading up to elections, because that's how you build relationships. That's how you build trust. And then that way, when you're talking about issues, you have established that relationship. That was Karen Woodall, Executive Director of the Florida People's Advocacy Center, on the Deeper Dive with Derek Cam podcast. And you can hear the full episode wherever you get your podcasts. Coming up on Capitol Report, law officers say a troubled teen in North Florida needed help from the state's child welfare agency. Help that didn't come. We felt like that child should be in a different environment. She should be in foster care or a program and they refused to do it. And as this year's active Atlantic hurricane season draws to a close, we'll talk with a storm expert who sees the potential for even worse hurricanes in the future. To me, the most concern is the sea level rise, and when a hurricane comes ashore, whatever sea level rise is going to be added to that hurricane's impact. The Florida Department of Children and Families is taking issue with Franklin County Sheriff A.J. Smith. He's calling for the agency to do more for abused and neglected kids in his jurisdiction. The back and forth has been years in the making. And as Margie Menzel reports, an expert in Florida's child welfare system says the numbers show Smith has a case. DCF responded to Smith's complaints on Friday after he spoke to WFSU and wrote a letter to Governor Ron DeSantis. In both, Smith says he asked DCF for help three years ago and was promised a full-time child protective investigator. But that hasn't happened. Smith cites the case of teens who are homeless, addicted, and or victims of sexual predators. He says the problems go back years. He wants an investigator in Franklin County seven days a week. And a note to our listeners, the sheriff's description of the following case contains graphic and disturbing details. A 13-year-old had been sexually abused by four different men uh, in their 20s and 30s. My victim advocate, my investigators, me, (laughs) we felt like that child should be in a different environment. She should be in foster care or a program and they refused to do it. In response, WFSU asked to interview DCF Secretary Siobhan Harris regarding Smith's concerns about the agency's responsiveness. That was denied. The department did send a statement explaining its investigatory process. DCF noted that when a sex abuse complaint is received, the agency launches an investigation within 24 hours. The agency says law enforcement is, quote, responsible for simultaneously investigating criminal activity and adds that the final decision on whether to remove a child from a home is made by a dependency court judge. When the sheriff wrote to DeSantis, he noted that of the 13-year-old who was assaulted by four men, quote, two of which we have a possible criminal case pending. Franklin County is a small county, but according to DCF's data, they average approximately 11 new investigations per month over the last four years. And national child welfare organizations recommend child protective investigators handle no more than 12 investigations per month. And DCF's own reports about their investigators show that the, the statewide average is closer to 10 investigations per month. Robert Latham is the associate director of the Children and Youth Law Clinic at the University of Miami Law School. He's long followed DCF. Latham believes many of the issues are due, in part, to the ongoing and extremely high turnover rate of child protective investigators at the agency. It's hard to keep CPIs on the job. According to the department's online dashboard, the vacancy rate for CPIs is 11 to 12 percent. The turnover rate is 70 percent. It's a difficult job. It requires a lot of support. It's a very emotionally taxing and complex job. You're being asked to make life or death uh, decisions. You're an emergency responder. And a lot of people get into it not understanding what what it is, and and they they don't get through the year. 
DCF's high turnover has long been a concern for the state. Even as far back as 2017, the agency and the state legislature were trying to solve the problem. Smith says he knows the turnover issues are problematic and says they can't be allowed to continue. He's frustrated and growing impatient. That's the secretary's responsibility to figure that out. If it means taking people in leadership roles and putting them in the field until they can be filled, do it. They got 12,000 employees. Come on. I'm Marty Menzel. Florida Surgeon General Joseph Latipo is recommending that municipalities stop adding fluoride to their water. He calls doing so public health malpractice. But public health organizations such as the American Dental Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics say fluoride serves an important purpose and they stand by its use. Regan McCarthy reports Latipo's recommendation follows discussions taking place on a national level. President-elect Donald Trump's pick for Health and Human Services Secretary Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has said if confirmed to the position, he plans to remove fluoride from drinking water nationwide. Now Florida's Surgeon General Joseph Latipo is following suit. Although Latipo told reporters during a recent press conference, it's an idea he's been working on for a while. We are issuing guidance to every community, every municipality, every, every, every county in Florida to stop adding fluoride to their community water systems. Latipo says while in medical school, he learned that fluoride helps to protect oral health, especially for children. And as a physician, he has backed its use. Then came a study from the National Toxicology Program. I was appalled, frankly, to, you know, just to be completely frank with you. The study found children exposed to higher levels of fluoride could experience IQ deficits and some bone problems. But the study was focused on drinking water in other countries, where fluoride content is sometimes twice the amount recommended for use in the United States. Some scientists say more work is needed to study the effects of fluoride at lower levels. And Latipo says it's not worth the risk. Based on these findings, and in recognition of the fact that there are other sources of fluoride that people in communities have access to, whether it's brushing with fluoridated toothpaste or whether it's using a fluoride mouthwash, and there are other sources too, people go to the dentist and receive fluoride there, that it is, it is, it is public health malpractice with the information that we have now to continue adding fluoride to water systems in Florida. Dental health experts say removing fluoride from public water systems will most likely hurt low-income and minority children who might have less access to dental care and less ability to purchase fluoridated products. Jeff Otley is president of the Florida Dental Association. He says fluoridating water helps prevent dental decay and sets kids up for better oral health. If we remove that, then we are placing our, the children in those communities at risk of higher levels of tooth decay at an earlier age. Organizations such as the American Academy of Pediatrics maintain that fluoride used at the level recommended in the United States is safe for children. And dental health experts say studies conducted over the past several decades indicate the lower level of fluoride added to drinking water is safe. I'm Regan McCarthy. Well, happy Black Friday to you. Florida retailers are hoping for record-breaking sales this holiday season. They expect more than a 3% increase from last year in spending. According to the Florida Retail Federation, consumers in the state are expected to spend $902 per person on gifts, decorations, and other items this year. More than half of all consumers are expected to shop online. Florida Retail Federation spokeswoman Amanda Beavis says consumers are on the hunt for bargains this year. Consumers have a lot of generosity heading into the holiday season, wanting to purchase gifts for their family. We're back up to pre-pandemic levels of spending, so um, there's a lot of excitement about the holidays, and uh, we're ready to get started. The most popular holiday presents this year include gift cards, clothing, toys, and books. The holiday shopping season is the biggest time of the year for stores, with shops making more than 20% of their annual sales during the month before Christmas. 
Of course, this weekend is full of sports action, so we figured Capitol Report should have a bit of sports reporting as well this week. The Tampa Bay Rays are going to be playing at Steinbrenner Field in Tampa next year, and some Pinellas County lawmakers do not like that one little bit. In his recent Tampa Bay Times sports column, John Romano said it's possible that this could be the beginning of the end for the team on that side of the bay. I understand the arguments by commissioners, um, by the Clearwater Mayor Bruce Rector, that the Rays are getting a lot of money from the county, approximately $300 million to build a new stadium, and that it would benefit Clearwater and Pinellas County if they stayed on the side of the bay for the 2025 season. But the decision's not made in a vacuum. Then how do you think things will transition when those new members enter and new items come up, such as the bonds that are being mentioned for paying for the new stadium? The two new members have both expressed skepticism about the deal. Dave Eggers and Chris Latvala, who were no votes, are going to remain no votes. You know, from the outside looking in, it certainly appears that the commission will, at the very least, agree to postpone the bond vote again on Tuesday. And then if the funding models change or either one of these groups want to go back to the drawing board, would they legally be able to do so? Yes. I think the agreement just sort of goes away if certain criteria are not met. And, and we're getting very, very close to that point where the criteria is not going to be met. It doesn't mean that they cannot come up with a new deal or just modify this old deal, but it would require approval from both the St. Pete City Council and the County Commission, and the Rays would have to obviously sign off on it as well. From your perspective, what would be next for the Rays? Could this drive them out of St. Petersburg or Pinellas County, or are we thinking that it's currently going to stay the way it is? I think Major League Baseball in Tampa Bay area is at greater risk today than it's ever been. The Rays will be in a position where they can start looking outside of the Tampa Bay market if they want to. In your words, what kind of damage was done to the Trop and its interior? Obviously, the roof is blown off. The entire roof has to be replaced. That is the bulk of the repairs. But when the rainy season comes, that stadium will get flooded up and things will get destroyed. So the argument to put over $50 million and potentially more into fixing the trop roof and the damages inside the stadium, St. Petersburg is required by its use agreement with the Rays to provide them with a stadium. If they do not provide them with a stadium, two things are possible. One, the Rays can leave this market forever, and two, the Rays could try to seek damages from the city of St. Petersburg because they are losing revenues by not having the stadium that St. Petersburg is supposed to provide. So I think the the sort of calculus is, would we rather have the team still here, you know, spend all of this money and still have the team playing in Tropicana for a few more years and hopefully keep the new stadium deal alive? Or do we just blow everything up and potentially risk losing the Rays and still spend a lot of money because we are obligated to give them a stadium that we're now not providing? So it's looking very high risk. The whole thing is just a nightmare. I mean, there there is no good solution at all. I mean, you know, nobody in their right mind would say, yeah, it's a, it's a great idea to spend $56 million and possibly more to fix a stadium for, you know, two, maybe three years worth of baseball. Where is the money for the repairs going to come from? In this stadium, it is the city's responsibility. So the city does have insurance. They dropped their insurance coverage earlier this year, which turned out to be a horribly short-sighted decision. Right off the bat, the city is going to have to pay $22 million. They get 25 from insurance. That's 47. Then the city is hoping that FEMA uh, comes up with the rest of the money. But if the repairs exceed that $56 million, and I'm hearing more and more that that's likely, you know, I don't know how much FEMA is going to step in. I don't even know if FEMA is going to step in at all. What message do you have for Tampa Bay Ray fans? <laughs> Ooh, it would be... <laughs> Enjoy the heck out of the 2025 season at Steinbrenner Field because I don't know what the future holds. That was Tampa Bay Times sports columnist John Romano. You're listening to Capital Report from WFSU Public Media. I'm Tom Flanagan. Finally this week... The end of November marks the end of hurricane season, 
The impact of climate change on hurricanes is getting a lot of attention these days as global air and water temperatures continue to rise. But Dr. Christopher Lancy at the National Hurricane Center says the data is mixed as far as direct links go. He talked with WGCU's Mike Canary in Fort Myers. The evidence from the climate models suggests that we're going to have stronger hurricanes, which makes sense physically because, you know, hurricanes do rely on the warm waters of the the oceans and moisture. Um, But the physics is such that the upper levels of the atmosphere counteracts the warming of the surface. And so we do expect hurricanes to be stronger, but by 3 to 5 percent by the end of the century. So very small changes to how strong hurricanes are. So to put that into perspective, something that would have been a 100-mile-per-hour hurricane pre-industrial time would be a 105-mile-per-hour hurricane at the end of the century. So yes, hurricanes stronger because of global warming, but by a very small amount. The other aspect is numbers. So hurricane numbers, tropical storm numbers, should go down because of global warming, hmm. not more. And the reason for that, again, it's, it's a little more complex than it might seem at first glance, is because hurricanes and tropical storms really care about the wind shear, changing winds with height. And if there's more of that wind shear, it tears apart the storms, makes it harder for them to form. And the ones that form make it harder for them to reach their potential. And so it looks like, again, if the computer models are right, that we would expect 20 to 30 percent fewer tropical storms and hurricanes. So really, it's, it's, um, it's a pretty complex issue. Um, but to me, the most concern is the sea level rise. And when a hurricane comes ashore, whatever sea level rise is going to be added to that hurricane's impact. So there are physical processes in play that no matter how warm the water gets uh, or how warm the atmosphere gets, hurricanes aren't going to just continuously keep getting bigger you know, there's more to it than just warmer means bigger, then warmer means bigger. Right. Is that a simple way to put it? Yeah. And, and when we're looking at a global phenomenon with climate change, and that's caused by man-made carbon dioxide and, and methane and additional water vapor, it's a global phenomenon. And so what we've been seeing in southwest Florida has been a lot of activity, but that is not duplicated everywhere. Uh, in fact, overall, 2024 was a quiet season globally for a number of hurricanes and typhoons. We get a little southwest Florida-centric, maybe? Sure, everybody <laughs> does, because it's what, what happens locally is what matters. But what we've been seeing right here is not being duplicated globally. Uh, and again, 2024 is a quiet global hurricane and typhoon season. I don't know if you can answer this or if you want to answer this, and feel free to not answer it if you don't want, but is there concern within the National Hurricane Center and NOAA about future funding and independence from the executive branch? So uh, I, I think we've been very successful under different administrations, and I, I'm very hopeful we'll continue to do that in future administrations as well. Uh, I do know that we have very strong bipartisan support, and we, we are providing science-based service to the whole nation. And when we do forecasts, we don't have one forecast for the president and one forecast for the everybody else. It's the same forecast for everyone. That was the National Hurricane Center's Christopher Lancy speaking with WGCU's Mike Canary. Our regular Capitol Report correspondents are Adrian Andrews, Lynn Hatter, Regan McCarthy, Margie Menzel, and Tristan Wood. Thanks also to Derek Ham and Mike Canary. Technical support for Capital Report comes from Taylor Cox and I'm Tom Flanagan. We hope you'll join us again next week on air and online for more reports from the state capitol. Capital Report is a production of WFSU Public Media in Tallahassee.